Thank you everyone for, for coming to today's uh, lunchtime, uh, lunchtime lecture. And it's my pleasure to, to introduce uh, our speaker, Julian Bailey. Uh, Julian is uh, from France. Uh, and uh, and uh, moved uh, to the United Kingdom to 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 do a uh, master's uh, in uh, NLP at Edinburgh some time ago, and then in, in in more recently has also done a master's in Sinology at uh, at uh, SOAS in London, uh, where it happens to be that I was his uh, his dissertation mm -hmm. supervisor, although I don't know that that you know uh, that, that may just be because no one else was available. Um, uh, but anyhow, he, he did a very interesting, uh, yeah, very interesting MA, and uh, this is the research that uh, kind of comes off of that. And then I'll also mention that you may have seen his name on our uh, our homepage at the Trinity Center for Asian Studies because um, he is also in his uh, professional life an NLP engineer at Microsoft, and uh, and together, uh, I mean, it's kind of ninety percent, ninety nine percent him, but. We are working together on making minority uh, language uh, auto completion keyboards. So that's so you may have seen him on our homepage in that context as well. But today it's about uh, Chinese historical phonology, and in particular the use of networks as a tool uh, for the study of rhymes. Uh, so with that, I will disappear from your view and let. Uh, and let uh, Julian do the talking. Uh, thanks, Nathan, for the intro. Uh, so I don't need to say more about myself. Uh, but yeah, as Nathan said, this is more or less uh, a rework of my MA dissertation, and uh, it's work in progress. There's an article currently under review. Um, and yeah, so we are, I'm going to hopefully uh, make a brief introduction in the field of like a reconstruction of uh, the Chinese phonology, um, and and uh, I will assume that uh, the audience has enough knowledge about it that I can be brief uh, in this domain. So, Chinese characters do not explicitly indicate pronunciation, as we know it's not a an alphabetic or syllabic script, and so when we try to reconstruct all the stages of the language. Uh, we rely on two different types of uh, information, explicit uh, information and implicit information. Uh, so in the range of explicit information, we have um, a variety of tools at our disposal uh, in no particular order. Uh, rhyme books, which are ri books that were written to, uh, to help poets know which character rhyme with each other, but without telling how they're pronounced, just saying, a rhymes with B and with C, etc. Rhyme tables, which provide some explicit phonetic information uh, regarding what the categories of rhyme books uh, represent. Uh, Fancy spelling, uh, which uh, I work like a rebus. I I don't know if you can see my uh, pointer. If you cannot, uh, please let me know because I'll use it also later. But uh, it tells us, hey, this character dong is pronounced. Uh, as a, a sum of these two characters, so tok and hung, we take the first, we take the first consonant of the first character and the rhyme of the second character, and it tells us uh, that the character is pronounced tong. Uh, we there's also some uh, researchers who make use of loan words from and two languages for which the script is phonetic. So if we know a word has been borrowed into another language and we know how that word is pronounced in that language that gives us some information and finally uh, last but not least uh, reflexes of these characters in modern dialects uh, and in the field of implicit information we have the the graphical structure of characters that tells us if this character contains this component it's likely to be pronounced similarly to other characters that have this, this component and finally, which is the topic of our uh, investigation today, rhyme. Uh, if two things rhyme, then they are probably pronounced somewhat similarly. Uh, we are very thankful in uh, Chinese studies to have a very wide range of uh, rhyming material. 
starting uh, uh, like uh, almost three million years ago with bronze inscriptions and of course the Book of Odes. Um, and we have extremely large corpora of uh, recorded poetry from the tongue and the song, um, hundreds of thousands of poems and that represents uh, millions of lines and of course uh, with a lot of this material rhyming or supposedly rhyming uh, that gives us uh, millions of examples of things that do rhyme together. There is currently no uh, comprehensive annotation of this corpus due to its size. Um, I do not believe that we can necessarily annotate it manually um, by a small team of people at least. And so my uh, research was aiming at uh, finding how we can annotate this, uh, this corpus. Uh, the goal of annotating this corpus is of course to provide uh, an, an ensemble of material where we can, as a collective uh, academic community, say we know these things rhyme, what kind of analysis can we derive from it? Uh, so annotating this corpus and having uh, collectively shared is a first step to the analysis. Of course, there have been plenty of people who did analysis uh, themselves, but as far as I'm aware, they have not published the corpus uh, on which they are relying. So this research is trying to address this. Uh, brief bibliography uh, as the main inspiration for this research was the last paper we see here, which is using network models to analyze all Chinese data by uh, Johan Matisse List. And uh, from the rest of the bibliography, you can see that I took a lot of inspiration from the work of uh, Dr. List um, and a few others, uh, including uh, Nathan and, of course, Chris Foster, um, who described why we need to annotate, uh, made tools to annotate manually, and here we're trying to address, let's do it automatically. So, um, automatic annotation. Uh, I'd like to introduce some uh, concepts um, I think the easiest type of annotator is what I would call a set annotator. So what I mean by a set annotator is we take the, the, the list of all Chinese characters that exist and we try to group them into rhyming sets. So if two characters belong to a set, they rhyme. Uh, it's a very simple concept. Uh, I have not seen uh, it being named before, but it's easy to understand uh, as an annotator if what you do is you go through a poem and you say, right, I've seen character A, which set does it belong to? And now I see character B, does it belong to the same set? Then it rhymes or it doesn't rhyme. So it's easy to understand, it's easy to inspect, and it's easy to visualize. Uh, the problem, the main problem with um, this kind of set annotators is they don't really take into account the context. Um, so as I just explained, you do, you say are A and B in the same uh, the same set, but now if I see a poem which has uh, let's say 16 characters that are in rhyming position, and 15 of them rhyme, we can we can suspect that the last one would rhyme as well. But a set annotator makes has no knowledge of this. So there are natural examples of set annotators, or at least of material that we can use for set annotation. So rhyme books, uh, rhyme books are the example of set annotator by excellence, um, because it groups all the characters that rhyme together. So if you take a rhyme book and you just take the time to encode it into sets, then you can automatically annotate an entire corpus. Um, in this presentation, I rely a lot on the Guang Yun uh, rhyme book um, as a convenient and like often cited uh, rhyme book uh, for annotation. You could use reconstructions. Um, so people who have taken the time to make reconstructions, you could use this reconstruction to say, well, these things rhyme, so I'm going to build a set with it. And of course, uh, without going to the land of reconstruction, you could just take any manually annotated corpora and say someone has already annotated this corpus and said that this character rhymes with that character, therefore I'm going to encode this knowledge into my annotator. Right? Um, so going to the taking inspiration uh, from the paper that makes um, that takes rhyme, rhyme networks and rhyme communities 
uh, to build, um, well, to make some, some analysis of all Chinese rhymes, I decided to use these to make a set annotator. So I'm going to explain how to build a graph out of uh, a list of Chinese poems and then how we derive a set annotator from it. So here we have three poems. Um, so they are all ranging more or less from like the like eighth and ninth century. I don't have the date of the poems for any of the poems, but I just have the date of the of the authors. Um, we can use it as an approximation. We assume that poets write poems when they are alive. And so here are the three poems, and I'll explain a bit the structure because we're going to use this kind of table all the time. So on the left column, we see the poem. Um, in some of my tables, I will have uh, one line per line, and in some others, uh, for consent of space, I will have uh, the two lines of a couplet uh, on a single line. So the rhyme column shows like the last character, so the character that's in the rhyming position of each line, and MC stands for Middle Chinese, and that's the reconstructed, well, reconstructed pronunciation um, according to uh, the Baxter and Sagar system. Um, so that's where I quote it from. Uh, so here we can see um, we have a poem where every second, every even line, even numbered line has something that seems to rhyme, uh, something like in uh, e, e, and then u and u. And sometimes the first line of a quatrain also uh, rhymes. And here I'm not sure if uh, the ta is supposed to rain with e and ke. Maybe it's, a, it's the intent of the poet, but I'm, it doesn't really matter whether it does or not here. And we get the same for the two other poems. So um, every even numbered line has something that seems to rhyme. So a, a, e, e, and the third poem has like three rhymes. So a, a, a. And from this, uh, we can build a graph. So if we go through the first poem and we take um, the character uh, pronounced A e and then the, pro the one pronounced K, we make a node for each of these characters and we draw a line to say they've occurred in a poem in, where, in which they're considered to rhyme. So the line uh, between, between the nodes represents the concept of each rhymed in a poem. We do the same for the next three characters. So these three characters rhyme together. So ku, ku, and tu. And because they all rhyme with each other, we have the three nodes and we make a line between e each of them, right? Uh, we continue uh, ke and hue. So we have, we've already seen ke before, it's here. So when we add a node and a line between ke and hue, we do not link hue with e because we have not seen a poem that shows them rhyming together. We just know that both of them in separate poem have rhymed with the same character, but that's it. And of course, this, the last poem has three characters that rhyme together, so we get this triangle. Right. Um, so this is the basic concept. Uh, when things rhyme in, in a poem, we just link all of them together. When they, when they rhyme, but in different poems, that there's no reason to link them together. So now we take this process, but we apply it to roughly 250,000 poems uh, taking fr uh, taken from the Quan Tang Shi, so the complete, complete Shi poetry of the Tang, and same for the song. So you can see these are fairly sizable corpora, which I argue we don't really want to annotate by hand. And I make two simplifying assumptions. Um, we could consider them perhaps even bad. Um, we consider that everything that's on even numbered line within a poem rhymes. And we also consider that everything, if it's in a rhyming position in a given poem, it rhymes with each other. So it's a simplifying assumption. And if we go back to the previous poem, we can see it's even wrong. Uh, because here, the assumption I make in this automated computation is that all these four characters rhyme. Here they don't, uh, and it's the same here. Uh, we see that e k does not don't rhyme with ku ku tu. But we're going to see that the technique we use after on the total graph makes it an ac an, uh, an acceptable assumption. So. We do this process on the 250,000 poems, and we get uh, this huge illegible graph. Uh, in fact, there's a bit more in the uh, southwest of this graph, but 
I thought I would make it slightly more legible by, by zooming on this area. Um, and well, what can we say from it? If we look a bit closer uh, to this graph, uh, we can see, so the way this graph is printed is if characters often rhyme together in the entire corpus, they are attracted to each other. And if they don't rhyme often with each other, they are trying to uh, push away from each other. So when we see a lot of character that seem to detach themselves from the rest, but at the same time form a tightly knit community, uh, this says these often rhyme in the corpus together. And if we just briefly look, we can see that there seem to be, you know, uh, I think a knowledge of uh, Mandarin pronunciation is enough there, uh, but you can see that characters, uh, maybe in Mandarin are pronounced with ng, uh, zheng, zheng, sheng, or ing, uh, xing, or maybe even some yong. Well, everything that's in Middle Chinese is like ing or ong seem to often rhyme together. And we see the same thing uh, with characters that are uh, rhyming in u, so gu, u, uh, some u as well, chu, etc. And we see the same with uh, an, ang, and a group that seems to be ao, ao. Um, and so the principle of um, the rhyming community, so I'm, I, I will pass on the description of uh, community detection, but the idea is that we look at a graph like this and we say, if uh, characters uh, are grouped together in a way where they have more links between each other than with outside of this group, then they form a community. So here, if we look at the in on group, um, they always rhyme, they very often rhyme together, but less often with the rest of uh, the corpus. And so that's the definition of a community. And uh, if we go back to the concept of set annotator, what happens is we can say, well, if things are in a community, then that's a set. The community is the set. And so we can start annotating our poems by saying these things did rhyme in the corpus, so we consider it a community, so now we can annotate the corpus. So I'm going to use a bit of color now so that we can see um, each color represents um, a community. Uh, unfortunately, there's only a, a very finite number of colors. And so uh, here the an and the ang are actually, let's say, two different blues and they represent different community. Uh, and so we see the algorithm um, identified the fact that the ing, ong, and then the u, and then the ang and the an belong to different groups. And so you can use this color to say, this is the set annotator. And by the way, if we go back to here, I had kind of identified au and eu as being a community because they seem to be detached nicely. But we see that uh, the algorithm actually found them, although they are very close to each other, and therefore they are like close community. And that means that they, often rhyme together, but not too often. So the algorithm says these are two different community. One is the EU community and one is the AU community. And uh, I should probably note here that uh, when I call them AN, ANG, ING, ONG, etc., I'm relying on the knowledge that of existing reconstructions. Of course, if you were to come to do, uh, to investigate the corpus yourself at first, you would not know these reconstructions. And so you would have to come up with your own label. Uh, we do not a priori know that these uh, communities uh, correspond to a specific label. Right. Um, so I hope this uh, little introduction was um, clear enough and hopefully I didn't take too much time. Um, and we are going to look at a few case studies of like, once we have uh, built an annotator like this, how does it behave? What can we do with it? Are there limitations? So the first case I have is a fairly trivial example. So we have a poem uh, from the 11th century. And as a lot of shi poetry, uh, what happens is there's a single rhyme uh, the entire poem. So here I've added the Middle Chinese reconstruction for all of these characters, and we can see uh, quack, black, mat, mat, jack, etc. Uh, so all of these seem to rhyme because they end in at. Um, if we look at a rhyme book, uh, the Guangyun, 
we see that all of these characters that are in the rhyme column are listed as rhyming in the Guangyun. So that's good. We have a kind of confirmation that it seems to work. Our system um, has annotated. So here, uh, the type of annotation we see when it says A, 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 it means the character after the annotation is part of a rhyme and this rhyme is A. So the fact that all of them say A means all of them rhyme together. Uh, if we looked at uh, the poems earlier, we would have had some A, A and then some B, B to mean these two characters rhyme together and those two characters rhyme together, but the two uh, different groups don't rhyme with each other. So that's a fairly trivial example. And of course, um, there's not much merit perhaps. It's, it may just be uh, by chance that we said, well, everything rhymes and it just happened to be so. So we can look, oh yeah, uh, so we can see uh, here, this is a little graph that shows it takes all, uh, so, sorry, it's a subset of this graph, but looking only at characters that ever came into contact with one of these characters. So any poem that has one of these characters, we look at what are the other characters that rhyme with it, and we end up with this graph. So we clearly see the act community uh, being like uh, disjoint for the, from the rest. And so it seems to form a community of its own. And of course, there were a lot of poems where there were other characters, uh, but that, that makes a undistinguishable uh, mess. So anyway, um, to convince ourselves that the system is working and I, that I didn't just write a piece of code that says everything rhymes all the time, uh, which if you remember was one of the simplifying assumptions we make uh, when we train the model. Uh, let's look at a poem where um, the rhyme changes every quatrain. So here we have uh, each, on each line we have uh, a, cou uh, a couplet, so two lines actually, but uh, trying to take less space. So two lines correspond to a quatrain. And if we look at the rhyming characters, we see that it seems to roughly rhyme every two line uh, together. So ip, ip, on, en, in, in, ong, ung, and then o, u. So of course, uh, some of these may feel like they don't particularly rhyme, but that's, uh, I'm going to ignore this. Uh, it seems clear from the intent of the poet that it was meant to be A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E, E. Um, and, um, whoop. Uh, so I take this just as an example uh, to show that the community annotator is able to detect this kind of pattern. So even though at first we told the training, during training, everything within a poem rhymes, the system is able to learn that in fact, not everything in a poem rhymes. And here, when it's presented with a poem like this, it's able to say here, not everything rhymes together. We have this pattern of A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E, E. Oh, and by the way, um, the other simplifying assumption was uh, I'm only looking at even numbered lines. So this A, B, C, D, and E that we see here, uh, as a way to make things simpler for myself, uh, I've completely ignored them. Um, and I think it doesn't really matter for the purpose of um, this talk. Right, so now we've seen that it works and can we make more interesting things with it? Uh, because here, um, well, yeah, let's see a, a more interesting case. So let's look at when um, another, another annotator disagrees with the community as annotator. So for instance, we know that poets try where, or were in, uh, incited to use the rhyme books to choose the characters to use in, uh, in their poem for rhyme. But in practice, uh, poets greatly diverge from this ideal of using the rhyme book. So here we have a poem in which um, the community annotator said everything rhymes together, but if we had looked into a rhyme book, it would say, well, actually, most of these things don't rhyme with each other. And if we look at this poem in particular, it would say there are eight different rhymes um, that appear. So we have this kind of discrepancy between 
uh, the very prescriptive rhyme book says this doesn't rhyme and the fact that our community annotator said based on the entire corpus it looks like these things rhyme together um, and if we take um, the characters that we see here and we look at the graph uh, the subgraph uh, of what we've seen earlier this is a graph so uh, sorry the fact that it says a, 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 a here means the community annotator considers that these characters in the second column all belong to the same set, or we can say in the, sa in the same community. Now, if we plot this community, and here the colors represent which Guangyun rhyme it is, we can see that we have something that is very tightly um, knit. So. Like if I remove all these colors and make them all blue, uh, you would not notice that there are different groups, right? They are too, too closely stuck together. We can kind of see that there's a split uh, between West and East on this, and this corresponds to the, uh, a tone split. So even though all of these characters uh, were largely used interchangeably uh, as rhyming, uh, we can still kind of see that uh, we have the the rising tone on the left and then the departing tone on the right. Uh, so of course it was common practice to uh, have inter inter rhyming uh, between those uh, those groups, but it was not perfect. So this graph it is the result. Of, this shows the community on the entire uh, tongue and song corpus. So we are spanning 600 years of poetry and. 80% uh, of that poetry is from the song. Now, if we build, if we uh, go back to when we said we're going to build an annotator for the entire uh, tongue and song, and instead we say, let's build an annotator for just the tongue, what we see is a very different picture. So uh, what happens is with an annotator that is trained only on, on tongue poems, uh, so earlier poems, it annotates the poem as having five different communities instead of just one. Uh, and of course, we said the Guangyun considers there are eight communities. And, and here we can see, as opposed to the previous graph, like these communities are fairly separate. Of course, there is some contact with them, like every uh, gray little link shows uh, inter-community um, rhymes, but overall, they're very distinct. So. This could be an avenue for us to see, uh, to track um, diachronic change in rhymes by saying, if we build an annotator, which is empirical, on an early corpus, and then we build another annotator on the later corpus, and we annotate a single poem, and they annotate the poem differently, then that must mean that perhaps there was a change in rhyming practice, and perhaps that change in rhyming practice is due um, to a change in phonology. So we'll come back to this uh, a bit later, but let's go with the fourth um, case study, which maybe shows the limits of the community annotator. So here we have a very simple poem um, with four rhyming characters. And uh, here I didn't go with Baxter and Saga, but I've used the, the reconstruction by uh, Edwin Pulley Blank uh, of late Middle Chinese. So here, of course, we have a poem that's 13th century, so it's actually uh, far beyond uh, the stage of late Middle Chinese, which would be, I think, in Pulley Blank's view, something like 7th or 8th century. Uh, and this 13th century maybe corresponds more closely to early Mandarin. But for the purpose of um, illustration, this, this is uh, fine to use LMC because, of course, our corpus is um, more centered on the tongue and song. And here we are really uh, at the end of the song. Um, so we have four characters that, according to LMC, seem to rhyme fairly well. So huai, hiai, hiai, and pai, uh, with a long vowel and uh, an offset uh, J glide. But our annotator considered that the the tia character, or the kiai uh, character, does not rhyme with the other. And if we look at the poem, of course, there seems to be very little doubt that the intent of the poem is to make this third character rhyme uh, with the rest. So why does the annotator 
uh, disagree with it. So the intent is clear. And if we look at um, rhyme books, uh, we can see that this character, the ki, is listed as belonging to the so-called ki rhyme, uh, that is to say itself. Uh, it, it's just a coincidence here. Um, both in the Guangyun and in the Ministry of Rights uh, rhyme book, uh, which is a bit later, and uh, it will become relevant a bit later. And so that's for the rhyme books. So it seems the poet uh, agreed, well, took things from the rhyme book. And however, our community annotator says, uh, Kiai, so this character actually rhymes with the me, uh, with the me rhyme. So why is that? If we print uh, a graph of just these two rhymes, so I've colored in blue the me rhyme and in orange the Kiai rhyme, uh, we can see that although they are fairly distinct, there's a lot of uh, contact that seems to happen between the two in the middle. So um, some communities, although they are distinct, can be uh, more or less uh, close to each other. And if we look a bit closer uh, to the interface of this graph, um, what we see is first that uh, the Ki is very much in the boundary there. So it means it has a lot of contact with the Ki with its own rhyme group, uh, but it still sits uh, quite nicely in the May rhyme. And if you have sharp enough eyes, uh, you may notice that the characters at the interface between these two groups, um, they all have this quay, uh, the same phonetic component. Um, so uh, we see ya, I don't know this one, ya, wa, uh, some wa as well, wa, ya, etc. And so it may be interesting to look at these. And of course, it's interesting that they all share the same phonetic components. Um, so if we look at these characters in a rhyme book like the Ministry of Rights, um, what we see is they are all listed as, per as belonging to both rhymes. So it's kind of the aha moment. Um, this explains kind of why we see these two communities being very close, is that the rhyme books themselves uh, say that these uh, a range of these characters that we saw there in the sorry uh, that we saw in the middle, they're actually listed in in rhyme books as belonging to both groups. Um, and if we look at Puli um, Blank's reconstruction of late Middle Chinese uh, for these characters that most often rhyme with Kiai, we see that a lot of them uh, rhyme with, in A, and some of them rhyme in Yai, uh, or just I. Uh, but m the majority of the characters that are found in the corpus as rhyming with Kiai actually are in A, which suggests that um, this character kind of had already lost its uh, J glide at the end. And of course, uh, in modern Mandarin, it's uh, Kia, so the glide has disappeared. Um, right? So, what can we conclude of this? Um, from the poem, it's clear the intent of the poet is to say this rhymes. Uh, the poet is justified in that all of the rhyme books seem to agree that this character has a J glide and rhymes with the Huai, Hai, and Bai that we've seen. Uh, but in practice, uh, if we look at all of the poems of the tongue and the song, uh, at least in the shi, uh, genre, uh, we see that 78% of the time, uh, it does not rhyme with characters that have this J glide, but it rhymes with characters that have this either A or A uh, rhyme. And I found it interesting to note that uh, these 78%, uh, or at least a very large majority of it, was already the case in the tongue. Uh, so in fact, it was even worse during the tongue. There's only nine occurrence of the character in rhyming position, uh, but eight out of these nine it was not rhyming with a year at the end, but with a simple a. Um, and geography does not seem to play a role either. Um, so in modern Cantonese and modern uh, Minnan, uh, these characters, uh, so the character uh, Tia, uh, still has a J glide. But if we look at all the poems of the tongue and the song, it doesn't seem to be there doesn't seem to be a correlation between geography and the use of this character as a rhyme. 
So the annotator is wrong, clearly, about this poem, because it should have annotated as AAA, but it seems that the poet's choice is a bit uh, weird, or maybe we could say conservative. It kind of obeys the rhyme book, but nobody spoke like this anymore, and indeed the character had already lost this Jake Glide. So anyone would have read the the character, the poem um, in the current pronunciation of the time would have found that it didn't really rhyme. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, bit, I think, uh, is that the annotator can be wrong because it didn't take into account context, but usually when it is wrong, uh, it is wrong with a good reason. And um, maybe a human would also uh, consider that these two things should not have been picked to rhyme. Right, so um, it says recap, but it's not the end. Um, a little recap of what are the, the advantages of this, uh, of this community annotator. Um, it works on non-annotated data. So if you remember, we started by taking the corpus and just assuming that everything rhymed. So we didn't need to go and annotate anything. We just said, we are going to assume everything rhyme at first and then get the community annotator to kind of disentangle all of these and uh, decide what rhymes with what doesn't rhyme. As a result, it requires uh, very little expert knowledge. Uh, and I think uh, I'm a proof of this here. Uh, so I discovered a lot of things uh, just by using the tool and exploring. Uh, it's empirical. So it means even if you didn't have any rhyme book, just by taking your corpus that you have at hand, you can train it to then make these kind of uh, discoveries. I've worked on uh, an accuracy metric for this, and I've annotated manually um, a few hundred poems uh, of various types, um, and I found a 98% accuracy in the, um, in the annotation. Uh, we'll see that there's a bit of caveat is that the sh uh, genre of poetry is very easy to annotate because it has a tendency of having everything rhyming uh, in a single poem, which is why my simplifying assumption earlier is actually okay for this type of poem. If we were working with something like uh, or all the poetry, it may be not a very good idea. Um, and it makes it very easy to highlight odd poems. So these poems, you know, out of a corpus of a quarter millions of poems. Uh, being able to find this interesting example uh, was very easy, and I didn't have to, to sift through hundreds and hundreds of poems or thousands. And of course, as we've seen in case uh, 34, uh, the problem is that as a set annotator, it misses the intent sometimes. But at the same time, the fact that it missed the intent in the last case study kind of gave us some interesting discussion. Right, so earlier in case study three, um, I mentioned that if we looked at an annotator trained on the tongue and an annotator trained on the song, we could see uh, if the annotation was different for a given poem, it could mean that uh, there was a phonological change. Right, and uh, we seem to have seen uh, rhyme merge and rhyme split. So rhyme merge was in case three where we said, uh, something that used to be annotated as five rhymes in the tongue is now annotated as a single rhyme in the song. And uh, we've seen a sort of sort of split with the case 34, where we say something that used to be rhyming uh, actually became, well, should have been considered not rhyming anymore in the 13th century. So can we date these changes? And can we detect them automatically? And uh, I propose uh, a strategy for it, and it's to say, since we know in this corpus uh, the date of birth and death of the poet, we can kind of assign a, a creation date to a poem by saying roughly mid-life of the poet. And now that we are able to say for each poem, that's when it was composed, we can have a sliding window where we say, I'm going to train an, an annotator every 50 years by taking the poems that are 50 years apart uh, from that point. And so only these poems. So I train an annotator based on the poems composed between 600 and 700, an annotator between 650 and 750, and et cetera, et cetera. So I, as we move, we have annotators that are empirically specialized 
to a given period, uh, to a given century. Uh, we can go more or less granular, you know, like the details here are uh, up for, for debate, but um, a window that is 100 year wide and that moves by 50 year step uh, seems to be doing okay. And if we go back to the poem uh, of case 33, so this is what we had. This was with having an annotator for the tongue and an annotator for the song. And we said, okay, in one case, um, we have five communities, one color per community. And in the second case, we have one community where I've used a color to show all of the different rhymes according to the rhyme book. But if we colored by community, this would be a single color. So now we annotate this very poem with uh, the sliding window annotator. And what we get is that um, what I'm plotting is how many rhymes are there in the poem uh, based on an annotator in 650, 700, 750, etc. And what we see is that at the beginning of the tongue, um, this poem would have been considered to have six different rhymes. And so it would not have been a very good poem because um, I, the poem was, was composed here. And so it was the intent from the poet that everything rhymes. But if someone from the tongue read this poem, it would have said, this doesn't rhyme at all. There are six different categories. Uh, here, there seems to be a little glitch, I, which I cannot explain. And once we reach the interregnum between the tongue and the song, so roughly 10th century, we see that successive annotators consider less and less that these are different categories and the number of uh, distinct annotations fall to one, which is, uh, what seems to be correct, that is to say, everything in that poem rhymes. And once we reach uh, the end of the, the song, uh, there's an interesting phenomenon where the number of rhyming categories seem to climb again to three. Um, and what this means is here, we witness a, a merge. Uh, so we used to have the, uh, six categories and then we have one. So that's a succession of merges, of course. Uh, exactly when each of them happened, we don't know, but we, and maybe that already happened in, in the common speech, but at least in poetry, there's a clear mark where we say from 900 onwards and in a window that seems to span 130 years, all of these characters that were pronounced fairly differently now have the same rhyme. And what we see here when the uh, number increase again is things that in the 12th century uh, all rhymed, now they cease to rhyme. And so we can have a, a deep dive into why that might be the case. Uh, so that's a lot of information on this, but um, I show uh, kind of the result of an annotator in 860, 1100, and 1300. So if we go back to here, that correspond to before the merge, after the merge, and uh, after the final split. And uh, what we can see, if we look at the column that's called community 860 and the one that's called uh, Guangyun annotator, is that in the tongue, there was a very strong agreement between the community annotator trained on that period, trained on ninth, ninth century, and the Guangyun. So there are a few discrepancies, but overall we see AA, CC, AA, et cetera. So that means that the behavior for this rhyme, at least, of poets in the ninth century was still very close to the Guangyun. Uh, the fact that here uh, Pan as a B is because it only appears like three or four times in rhyming position. And so there was not enough data to retrain it properly. And so we have a misclassification. Um, once we move to uh, 1100, uh, we see that everything rhymes. And if we look at the late Middle Chinese reconstruction, uh, by the way, late Middle Chinese may be a bit early for 1100, but anyway, we see that Pulley Blank reconstructs all of them as having an A rhyme, which was not the case in early Middle Chinese, where we had some like A, Ya, uh, etc. So this explains why we got a merge. We went from having uh, six categories here. So if we count the different letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, so that's six. And in 1100, we only got one letter, which means uh, everything rhymed in the poem. And finally, 
if we look at uh, what happened in 1300, and for illustration, uh, I showed an early Mandarin reconstruction by Pulley Blank. Um, we see that we have three letters now, A, B, and C, and that these correspond, uh, of course, to a different vowel, except for the pan again. I don't know what's going on with this one, um, but uh, Pulley Blank explains it as saying <clears throat> that um, characters for which there was a, a, y, a E or a U uh, glide, so Kuan, uh, Yen, Mien, uh, the A uh, was fronted and became an E. So all of these that we see, uh, I colored them in blue and they all have an E. The one that have a U glide, so Juan and Juan, uh, the A became uh, even more back uh, and became an O, uh, which I've noted in, in red. And uh, finally, the ones which had a long vowel, so kian uh, and here Hian, um, he argues that the, um, the length of the vowel prevented it from being fronted or backed. Uh, and so they remain with an A. And that's how we get um, this kind of uh, what we see in this graph here, with first we go from six, we fall at one, and then we get back to having three different uh, things. Uh, of course, um, here I've discovered this poem and this uh, interesting phenomenon, and then I tried to figure out why. And thankfully, um, uh, Edwin Pulley Blank had already kind of explained this phenomenon, but it's interesting that I was able to discover this uh, thing as well with uh, much less specialist knowledge uh, and less time as well. So that's how you can discover rhyme change. Um, that's more or less the end of this presentation. Uh, it's still a work in progress. Um, I have an article in the uh, review uh, for this. Uh, the annotation of the entire corpus as uh, described has been published uh, here with this DOI if you're interested in it. Um, we have an annotation accuracy metric and it seems to behave uh, very well. So 98% accuracy on the full Tang and Song Shi poetry. Uh, and if we exclude the poems in which uh, the pattern is fairly trivial, uh, we get 84% accuracy, which is, uh, which is lower, of course, than 98, but it's much better than what you would get if you had an annotation done by a rhyme book. There's more work needed. Um, here, uh, Shi poetry is rather easy because it tends to be uh, a lot of A, 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 so single rhyme per poem. But if you go to use a corpus like Tse, uh, so for instance, there's a very big collection of Tse poetry from the song. Or if you go, of course, with uh, earlier corpus than the tongue, uh, it might be more difficult and you might have to maybe bootstrap by annotating by hand a bit and then running the algorithm, etc. cetera. But uh, I think the algorithm would provide a good speed up. And an area of particular interest for me is, of course, um, I've shown how we can uh, highlight uh, rhyme merges and rhyme splits, but can we automatically discover them uh, to bring all of the poems that are relevant uh, for analysis and refine uh, our knowledge of uh, Middle Chinese evolution into early Mandarin? Uh, and of course, this can be done synchronically. Uh, for these poems, we know where the authors uh, were from, and so if we approximate their origin with their dialect, um, we could perhaps see uh, some merges spreading from Northwest China to Southeast or this kind of thing. Right, uh, thanks. Um, I'm happy to take any questions or uh, even more suggestions for the work. And if you want to get in touch, you have my email address here. Uh, okay, maybe you can put your your presentation away or I don't know what. Yeah, I can. Uh, I, I don't I know. Uh, yeah. Maybe but, questions will be about us. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe it's good to leave up. Um, uh, let me just say to everyone that, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, you can put things in the chat if you want, but also if you feel comfortable, you can just unmute yourself and uh, show your face and, uh, and say something. Uh, to to get things started, I'll just uh, ask a simple question, which is, you were saying that the Tzu poems are are um, 
more complicated, right? But it seems like actually then uh, you've done things, let's say, it, it, it be, precisely because the shi poems are simpler, uh, uh, annotator trained on the su poems is likely to do very well on the, sorry, an annotator trained on shi poems is likely to do a very good job on su poems. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's supposed to work by period, I would say. So yeah. we could use this uh, shi trained annotator to annotate the su corpus. That is true. Uh, but um, out of this case, if you said you want to annotate, uh, I don't know, uh, preaching poetry, then it might not work uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, okay, so if someone wants to, uh, I don't know, if someone wants to jump in and ask a question, uh, please go ahead. I can't, you know, tell who, who you are. <laughs> Let me... Uh... Uh, <laughs> this is where it would be nice if you know if we were in 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 if I could see everyone because then I would say oh you look like you have a question but uh, I can't do it so uh, uh, <laughs> um, if I could hi Chris Foster here can you hear me. Hello. Hi, sorry, um, I can't unmute my uh, my video for the moment. Um, but maybe if 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 I could just uh, ask a, a very simple question here for someone who's not as technologically uh, savvy, um, the role of those two initial assumptions that you built in to initially train the annotator, um, yeah. you know, rhyming on every even line, and that all words rhyme with one another. Um, can you maybe just explain a little bit more why you picked those, why it's necessary to have those, yeah. um, and why not other options? So why not just say every word rhymes with every word and start with the, you know, everything rhymes with everything everywhere and then let it sort of work it out on its own. Yeah. Um, just something that I was curious about and I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a very good question uh, because the entire work is based on this. Um, so the two assumptions, they work against each other in a way. Um, so the assumption that everything in rhyming position rhymes in a poem introduces a lot of noise in your algorithm, right? Because um, we know it is, it is not, not true. Um, and the community detection algorithm, uh, so which, makes, which goes from this and makes that, um, is able to sustain an amount, a certain amount of noise and say, right, I have seen contact between this character and that character, but not often enough to be sure that they rhyme together, right? So it's the fact that we have enough matter for which the assumption is correct. So in other words, uh, the noise is limited. That mean that makes the community detection still work. Um, <clears throat> so that's the second simplifying assumption. Um, if I had taken uh, every single character to be potentially rhyming, it would have generated so much noise. You know, you would have said, oh, I, I think that every single character rhyme with each other. Um, the noise would have drowned the signal. Uh, because if we look at, uh, let's take any poem, you see here we have uh, 10 po characters in rhyming position and we are creating a graph with these 10. Now, if we said we're going to take these uh, something like 100 characters and we said they all rhyme together, they would all of this signal that is correct here, that is to say, yeah, indeed, in some poems, all the characters rhyme. Uh, and we said, actually, everything rhymes in this poem. It would have completely drawn the signal. I don't know. Is, is my explanation any clear, uh, Chris? Yeah, no, that makes that makes complete sense. So basically, what you did was, as a shortcut, you took a non-arbitrary judgment, um, in the sense that, okay, commonly we see every other line rhyming. So if we start with that, you know, very yeah. simple assumption, that can help us sort through the noise in a way, give us a foothold into it. Yeah, that's, um, that's a way to say that's that's the the smallest part of expert knowledge that you can bring. I don't even know if you can call it expert knowledge, but uh, specialist knowledge, let's say. So, so that being the smallest 
uh, sort of uh, assumption of you know expert knowledge. Um, have you then also brought in so annotations that have been done by other scholars of poems, individual poems, taken that and used that to help the annotator sort of refine its learning or does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so this is a possibility. This is not something I've explored, uh, but here these two assumptions that let me start with non-annotated text. Um, you can also train, and this is what uh, uh, Mattis List uh, does in his research on, on old Chinese. He says, let's take the annotation from, uh, I believe, Baxter on the Book of Odes and put it into, build a graph from these annotations, look at what the communities look like, and then comment on, uh, so I believe he comments on the existence of a new type of rhyme that was not uh, reconstructed uh, before. Uh, so yes, you can you can use annotated corpus, and you could do anywhere in between. So you could say I'm going to start from no annotation, and annotate the corpus, and then review some of the poems, and and you know fix the annotations, and then retrain this kind of thing. So yeah, that's that's exactly what I was thinking of you know, list work, and then just curious if you've gone ahead and done that already with your annotator, and if you've seen um, any sort of changes, you know, significant changes. Um, I guess it would behave better, and maybe uh, for non shi poetry, then you would have to do that, maybe even bootstrap. And I think I kind of allude to it here when I say manual, manually annotated corpora are set annotators already. Um, and it, it's kind of what uh, Matthew Sliss does, is he says, right, it's already annotated, but can we apply community detection on top to kind of refine this annotation? Uh, yeah, if, 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 if I may just um, say, uh, so, so, you know, Julie and I have talked about this sort of stuff before a lot. And, and one thing that I find um, uh, a, a, a clear way of thinking is that one of these assumptions, one of these simplifying assumptions introduces false positives, which is that everything in rhyme position rhymes, that introduces false positives, whereas uh, the assumption that only things on even lines rhyme introduces false negatives. And so the, th that's what he means in terms of the, the assumptions kind of pushing in different directions. So it's a way, it's a way of saying like, well, you know, uh, uh, then we, we get rid of some of the signal and we get rid of some of the noise and hopefully we're getting rid of more noise than signal. Uh, and that way the, the, the community detection algorithm actually finds the communities and it, it seems to work. So, you know, there you go, right? Yeah, and you could train on even numbered lines, but then annotate on all the lines, for instance. You know, that's that's totally possible. And here I didn't try to annotate every character in the poem, you know, like I said, I will not try to annotate the first line of a quatrain, but it is possible to do. It's just not something that I tried to do because my interest was more in the detection of phonological change than in the production of a corpus. But um, yeah, that, that's an avenue uh, that can be followed. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for clarifying. Um, and also, I just think it's it's interesting. I, I know the focus here is on phonology, but I, I'm I'm I think you could almost retool this just slightly and bring in uh, paleography as well. Um, I can imagine sort of you know that sliding sort of approach that you use in terms of chronology, but also you know space, um, maybe being used to say okay, uh, different sort of orthographies of characters and how they match pronunciations of different periods. And, so forth, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would be super interesting. And I, li I liked uh, the fact that, you know, there was this example where uh, we see all the characters that have the same graphical component being just at this border, um, not making any claim on this, but um, yeah, this brings us back to uh, graphical, uh, well, sound components maybe being a good indication of a family of characters. My thought is uh, a way of testing sort of feasibility of orthographic variants in a poem uh, based on sort of what we understand of the chronology and, and yeah, geography of its composition. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, is are there there any other people who might have a question? Please don't be shy. You know, if you if you do. Um, But otherwise, it's actually we're we're right up against the time anyhow. So maybe it's a 
it's good if you don't have a question as well. Um, uh, but uh, let's see, yes. So uh, you also have uh, Julian's contact information if you uh, have a question. Uh, and uh, you know, if you're interested in, in this sort of work, you're also uh, welcome to get in touch with me. Uh, what to say. Thank you for, for Julian uh, for giving this uh, very interesting talk. And I think we all will look forward to uh, the published version uh, as uh, as one of the as yes as Yen in the uh, in the chat uh, also says. Uh, so uh, yes. So uh, <laughs> let me say I don't know uh, what to do in in this world. A round of applause, or you can you know make some little emojis or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> For Julian and. Um, and then uh, uh, I don't know. I'll see you at another another uh, talk sometime. Thank you all for joining us.